welcome back to the Okta Workforce Identity Developer Podcast. Today, I'm welcoming back Jeff Taylor, who is a senior product manager in all kinds of different areas now. What all are you currently working on, Jeff? Yeah, thanks, Emily. I'm happy to be here again. Uh, since we last spoke of, I've taken on some more areas of responsibility in our Okta integration network. So traditionally, I've worked on our developer toolings uh, that has to deal with our SDKs as well as our Terraform provider and our Okta AWS CLI, which connects our customers to the AWS environments that, um, that they work with. I'm now working on the Okta integration network to provide a better developer experience for our integrators on trying to launch their apps and work with, our, with their customers that are also Okta customers. Yeah, and we were able to catch up in person recently at Octane, which is Octa's big flagship uh, annual event. So how'd you like Octane, Jeff? Yeah, one of the things that I thought that was unique about this Octane, and this is my third, my mm -hmm. second in person, but my third overall, was the developer energy was the most I've ever seen in, in this particular conference. Uh, we also had a couple of firsts. Uh, you, of course, had your first uh, Terraform workshop, which I will say, not to toot your horn, but very well attended. And the most interesting part about your, your, your talk was it was attended by technical practitioners, both experienced and not experienced and non-technical practitioners looking to learn Terraform. And a good signal based on the data that we've been seeing on the overall growth and adoption of Terraform in general. Now, I also got to lead my first session on uh, Terraform as part of the main conference, again, which was a big landmark first. This was developers showing up in the main IT conference for uh, Workforce Identity Cloud. And what we did was we taught, we took customers through uh, deploying a passwordless test using a Terraform module, and we're even able to give somebody, they give give the people uh, some artifacts to to try out at home, which uh, you know, people are starting to look at. But it was a really really great energy level, and showing that you could actually go from zero to a Terraform module in about ten minutes that actually worked and caused changes in your subsequent environment was really kind of. Um, it was just a real landmark moment for our program. And again, for but my, three and a, my three years being here. And that live demo you did, I was delighted to be able to attend your talk. It was only about half an hour. And that was all the talk track that did get recorded. So I'll link the recording of that talk um, somewhere near when you see this podcast. Um, that was just incredible, though, going through it live, writing out the code, and then everything worked. Like, that was just um, such a good demonstration of how much faster and easier you can do stuff with the automation and developer tooling that is available. Well, there's, there's a big secret there. And yeah. I, I really <laughs> believe in like three things when um, I'm presenting to a large audience. Mm -hmm. The first is to provide a really good story from beginning to end. The second is to provide some actions and takeaways that you can take from my presentation and actually apply. The second is a bit of flair and showmanship, right? Like we want to make it actually memorable and authentic. And I do believe that live demos are a really great way to connect with the emotional toil sometimes of having to build this stuff and to give people a sense of hope that you can build these things in some low cost manners and actually get the intended outcomes that you want. And you're hearing from the experts. So if you can see me demonstrate it live on stage, you know that it's possible if, if I struggled, then obviously there's there's some problems there. But like that's, again, the, the, the key things that I really want to have in my presentations that really hope that they land and they're very memorable for for whoever attends. Yeah. And I found the more advanced nature of the demo that you picked to be really helpful because as a developer, I'm not necessarily going to trust the oh, the first steps were really easy because just everything you try. Uh, the bar is that the first couple steps are really easy, but then seeing, okay, here's how hard it gets when you take a bunch more steps into a much more realistic environment can be a much better test of how is this likely to look when I bring it into my more realistic environment. Yeah, and actually in my experience, following many tutorials, <laughs> having to learn many new things for developer concepts, that big leap over making a demo real and tangible is exactly the obstacle that you need to overcome. To vanilla, it doesn't really matter because it's not really getting at what my problems will be when I have to go implement it. And ultimately, it's it's me who's on the line for delivering the solution. So 
I really want something that's a little bit more meaty that can give me something better that I can work with um, when I take it back and also demonstrate the value of the conference that my company has like paid for me to go to. Yeah. And I would say that sort of going from the introductory level to taking those next steps is a bit of a theme in the way that we've been talking about developer content recently. We've been talking about enterprise readiness and enterprise maturity as pretty key terms in the needs that a developer will have around identity. Um, how do you see enterprise readiness and enterprise maturity playing out? Yeah, so I, I think it's it's a really interesting concept. I hear these two terms um, thrown around a lot. I really like enterprise readiness to describe the way that you're ready to compete to grab the business of enterprise customers. There's a series of capabilities that you need, and there's a series of value props that you must have so that you can walk confidently into that prospect and say, I can solve your problems. On the converse, you've got enterprise maturity, which is more of a ubiquitous concept because as companies grow and they mature, they need to actually adopt the ways that they do things. And what I've found in my practices is the signals at which you're ready to make the next step are just as important as the steps that you plan to take. Interesting. Um, do you have some examples of those kind of signals? Uh, maybe first on the enterprise readiness side? Yeah, so um, a lot of this comes after like where you're prospecting in the new area. So like everybody goes through yearly planning. And I think what's interesting is you look at the arc of B2C apps, like they're going to first go direct to users and they're going to try to appeal with these tiering and pricing plans. When you go to enterprise, it's a little different because the scales are much larger, right? And so you need to have a different like a different type of agility when you're trying to price this out. And then how do you figure out when that happens? And sometimes there's organic growth where you start to get signals. You're seeing maybe a collection of emails from a particular domain that represents an enterprise. And you're trying to say like, well, look at all of this stuff now in our user base. Like there's a lot of single service users coming from one particular source. It might be easier to directly integrate with that source so that I could expand. And that's again, the common concept in sales. I want to land and expand. And so how do I do that without necessarily creating, again, too much toil within my own enterprise, mm -hmm. right? So now I have to develop this strategy on how I can actually capture this market without breaking my own cost structure. So now I'm I'm like I'm looking at that signal and you can sort of see, right? There's a couple of um, there's a couple of key concepts in there, right? I want to analyze my data and figure out how I can notice my trends. Also, I kind of want to look at like how I'm progressing with my overall revenue goals and where I can start to be because everybody wants to continue to grow. There needs to be organic pivots that need to go there. And the question becomes, how do I actually make sure that those are going to be successful? No one wants to just take a leap and not know if the pool is filled or not. So you try to get as much backing as you can before you actually step out into that new arena. The way that I see the enterprise readiness and enterprise maturity concept is that they kind of they grow in parallel, um, kind of symbiotically, where yeah. the enterprise in this case is the customer that is buying software as a service, essentially. And so readiness is for my customers that are going to be buying my app. Um, do I have the integration standards? Do I have the features that they're going to ask for or that they really should be asking for with where they're at, even if they don't necessarily know to ask for that yet. Whereas enterprise maturity is within that organization, knowing what to ask for so that the vendors that you're getting your software from can help you meet those needs. And we see this play out um, with autumn or with standards, especially with, we have workshops on OIDC and Skim where it's like, you should not be handling a bunch of one-off user accounts for people from the same org. You should be integrating with their identity provider for various reasons. Not only is it easier for you, um, but it lets you add value for them in a variety of ways. And then with automation and Terraform, um, how can you within the enterprise for enterprise maturity uh, scale yourself better versus if you're external, then can you, if your customer is using Terraform, hand them some Terraform to set up your app? Would that be easier than asking them to click a bunch of buttons? You know, that's an interesting way to describe it, mm -hmm. right? Where, you know, your enterprise readiness, like, let's call it at a different stage. There's an entry stage. So there's a signal that you, you've got to, and there might be your table stakes, core capabilities. Mm -hmm. But there's a key part of what you just mentioned, right? 
my customers are going to continue to move through the same maturity stages. How do I stay sticky with those customers and make sure I can grow with them? And exactly what you said, as customers start to operate, manage at scale, you want to meet them where they are. So you want to be able for them to operate and manage your offering at scale. That's going to ensure that they're not going to lag or maybe mature out and go to a competitor, right? So exactly what you said is like your playbook like doesn't end with just like having the core set of capabilities. It is a process of learning and evolving. The other great thing about it is, as we know, companies are life cycles. It's a renewable market. So you know if you have offerings at different stages, you find out where that customer is at that stage and you just offer them the right set of tools. And that also makes your sales cycle a little bit easier because now you've got the right tools for the right use cases with the right keywords. Everybody's able to go in and meet that customer with what their needs are and sell the right and appropriate package to get them locked in and staying with them for a long period of time. Yeah, there's also this interesting caveat to that where if you are offering the standards, the functionality that your customer should need, then it's almost like this gentle nudge to get them toward better practices, get them toward the security or interoperability features that will make them much happier and more successful in the long term. And ultimately, having your own customers be successful is pretty good for you as a business, um, pretty good for you as a developer who hopefully likes working at the business where you are as well. Actually, like this is a this is a problem that's like near and dear to my heart. Like um, if you probably know anyone who knows that I talk to my customers, like I'm, I genuinely care about their success and not just their success for like today, but their overall success. I want to make sure that I'm building products and solutions that are going to alleviate pain over time, like so, like services, tooling for the longer term, right? And so sometimes that involves like getting into some real uncomfortable conversations. Like, I think you should change the way that you're practicing this particular procedure because overall, this is where the trends in the industry are headed. You're not in that right direction. So you're either going to pay this pain now when you have to make a big change, or you're going to pay it, you're going to pay it later when you have to make a bigger change, right? Uh, yeah. And so we're actually dealing with this when we're talking about service accounts. So service accounts, obviously, you know, I'm a philosophy major, I've studied religious studies. So I love this concept of machines operating as people. It's just, it obviously has so many science fiction uh, analogies and allegories, but honestly, like trying to like tease out, like, why are we doing this? Um, there's different ways. Like we have OAuth here with client credentials flows that can really secure this. There's new features coming with demonstrated proof of possession. If you look at where this industry is headed, we're making a clear delineation between clients and humans that are interacting with our applications. And so we should embrace that because the added security features are going to follow those paradigms. And again, the, the more that you defer, to the last possible moment, you're adding on pain to make that migration and also adding on urgency. And you may not know about the urgency at this time, but that urgency comes when you're forced to make a change and not electing to make a change. Yeah, you might be forced to make a change once it's already become too costly to keep going. Yeah. And that's just never a great spot to be in. That also reminds me though, of some other conversations we've been having around how we make our engineering decisions and how the decisions that we make about where to focus in our products are informed by feedback from the communities, from the developers. So how do you see that line between wait until it's late enough to know what people want, what people need, what people will use versus don't wait till it's too, too late? You know, keeping a steady engagement across multiple channels, right? Like it's not, you know, not just looking at GitHub issues or not just looking at support cases or looking at um, emails that are going directly to your slacks that are coming in. But it's taking a like taking a step back to actually like take a look with your engineering team and just sort of identify the trends. Are we seeing more debt trends in a particular area? Are we seeing more questions being asked in another? And really like, again, it goes back to data, right? How can you aggregate quickly and know the signal to make the right decision, right? Um, we have a couple of rubrics that we look for with like with with particular types of issues. We know that they're high priority. We also established our most popular resources. So we know those are most popular and we try to fix those issues to keep our customers on block. And then when it comes to like overarching things, there's there's uh, overarching enhancements. We take a step back and we look at what are the trends saying and then what is our opinion about the trends? And then also we go back and engage with those developers and share 
our opinions and those trends and just to get an idea of what the overall feedback is. And I think that actually provides this very vibrant, reflexive community where yeah. our developers feel like they're involved. And I'm, I'm speaking for that developer mm -hmm. community, but based on positive feedback that we've received, like that, you know, they're involved with our engineering and product team, and we're just very transparent and about what we're trying to do to make the Terraform provider. We do hear this, like when we go and talk to developers, like at our conferences at Octane, they're appreciative of the way that we engage with the community. And again, like, I feel it's like it's such an essential source of candid feedback. It's not curated, it's yeah. not interpreted. And so we can actually deal with that raw feedback and actually make some real decisions that directly positively impact the community. Yeah, and bringing it back around to Octane, uh, what were the trends that you were hearing from developers? Were there any surprises to you or reinforcement of things you'd already suspected? There's a common saying in, in the Hollywood industry that timing is everything, right? Like, or even in comedy, right? Mm -hmm. But timing here was really kind of funny. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll discuss like the two trends that we saw. The first was on, providing more real world examples. So we had an inkling about maybe six to eight weeks before Octane, like we could do something more with our, our modules and make them a little bit more real. Well, we knew with the upcoming conference, it was a really great test bed. We can build this session as a way to explore live a real world concept and see what the feedback is. If it falls flat, good signal that like, maybe we don't need to invest a ton of effort in. But if it's very popularly received, it's both mm -hmm. visible it's, a, it's quantifiable as well. So we know that we can actually act on it. Now up to Octane, we've got maybe one or two requests, but we started to see more requests coming in from our GitHub channels, even just from the field in general, that we wanted to see more real world modules. It was giving us the signals to go in the right direction. So we deliver Octane, feedback that we get right after that is yes, more modules all the time. And so now as we're going to take this back and plan, how can we actually build these concepts that we're talking about in our documentation and that we're releasing on a, on a, on a regular basis? How can we make this more real? Like, how can we like give an example or a companion module that you could just apply to a dev org and like see it work in action? Because again, it's very tactile, right? You apply, you do Terraform plan and apply, and then you're going to see the effect in your, in your org. You'll both check the effect in your admin, see the impact on your sample applications. And even so, what we tried to do was package this all, like build a sample app from like maybe our sample JS React application and start building like these rudimentary workflows in your in your own dev org, but try this stuff out, right? And then and then give us like because we'll start to see feedback then on these, on these modules and we can actually make them better. And this hopefully this will be like lower cost for us to like and one also like deflect from some of the cases that we're seeing with support, but also give us more insight into where the problems are with our customers. So that was one. The second one that we saw was, you know, how am I going to get Terraform at scale? Right. I love this one. It's like we love it. We're using it in other parts of the business, but you've got two things going on in Octa, right? You've got an admin UI. You've got, uh, you've got a Terraform. So how do I bridge these together? And talking to customers in depth about, you know, where they were wrestling with, like, how do we make this, these, uh, these concepts work together? That was really kind of intriguing. And the other thing is like, so this overarching thing about complementary processes and technologies, again, another thing, what about our workflows product? So how does workflows work with Terraform? When should we use it? And when should we not? All of these concepts were, were we were able to explore in these very open forums, which I love. Like it's me like talking about what I know about workflows and what I know about Terraform and really talking about the customers getting an idea of like what their challenges are from their, um, from their side. Maybe we can put in the comments or something here, a link to the gist that we created for Octane. And again, whoever's like watching this, you can take a look mm -hmm. at that gist and sign up for a dev org and give me a thought. It should have all the prereqs that you need, detailed instructions, even like a little bit of creative writing around the scenario that we had there too. So you get a little bit, you get a little bit of entertainment, a little bit of uh, constructive exercises to learn on, but hopefully you'll, you'll laugh, you won't cry, but you'll learn something in the end, right? And as I developed my uh, Terraform workshop for Octane as well, unfortunately, we weren't able to record the workshops, although we do have the workshops as posts on our blog. I was really struck by just what a quick feedback loop you get when you're just playing in a dev org. You write it, you apply it, and you can instantly see exactly what happened. And that may go a little bit slower if you're on a prod org. I would really strongly recommend testing all your stuff in a dev org anyways, because brick the dev org. You're allowed to. That's what they're for. And one tip on that yeah. to um, create a sample application that is independent of your end user dashboard and your admin console. 
Because I can tell you from personal experience, you don't want to break your admin console. It's also not a great idea to manage your own user that you log in as, because if you set something wrong there, then you're locked out. I always like using toy users. When I don't know the name to use on a toy user, I look out the window and I pick something and I look up the Latin name of it because everything has names. That's right. And it's one of the most uh, fun parts of building is to be creative and have fun with it. And like, again, one of my mantras is always to have fun. So whenever you're doing whatever you're doing, even if it's a little difficult, like if there's a big urgent task, like make it a little fun for yourself. I like to use some some characters from a galactic series. I'll just call it that. Um, some of the B-roll characters, uh, just to make my uh, examples a little interesting. One of the benefits when you're prototyping identity software of using real characters is you can start thinking about the things those characters actually did. Like yep. um, in my colleague Simona's workshop, she themed it off of a an entertainment franchise that she really enjoys. And in that, one of the characters left for a while and came back with a name change, decided that he wanted to be called something other than what he used to be called. And so going, wait, this is a thing that happens in real life. How do I handle this with my yeah. code is basically um, a free level of testing. Not the most rigorous, but better to have it than not. There's also an undercurrent. And again, like I can't, I, I can't resist from the humanist like bin that I always put in there, but like there's a connection that you make, right? You're obviously doing work. Um, so work can be entertaining. It can be boring. It can be mundane, but providing a little like levity or fun to it allows you to connect deeper like you're going to care like even what you were describing you're going to describe these scenarios because you are bonded to something that you really care about you find entertaining it's going to bring you a little bit more joy in working through this example i feel like that's really important you need enthusiasm to get through kind of the drudgery or the trudging through whatever you're trying to, to deal with and you know I, i'm just a strong advocate for that like make it fun like always make it fun because it helps. It just, it helps you care a little bit more about the material yeah. instead of like test user A, B, and C. I would also add that making testing feel a little bit more like play can help overcome the fear of breaking stuff bias. Because yeah. when you're playing, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to try something and not have it work in a way that that really wouldn't be okay in prod. And if you're in the space where it's like, it's okay to just try something. Oh, I wonder what would happen. I'm just going to test that. That's where a whole lot of learning and discovery comes from. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Have you been managing to do anything particularly fun like that recently at work? We're still, you know, basically coming back and talking more about some of the outcomes at Octane. Um, yeah. Again, like what our team is looking at is we're looking at how we can make our examples more tangible. Like, um, we've also been writing more documentation. I think that's uh, something that we're we're looking at to see how much more we can do there. Um, you know, just a lot of possibilities right now. And again, this is this is the time that we're planning. So there's nothing specifically that I can really get into, but I can do I do say that like there's a lot of really promising things on the horizon and a lot of opportunities that we have to really make um, building. Um, and managing Okta at scale a lot easier for our customers. And all the different customers that you were chatting with at Octane, were there common themes in about how far along in the scaling process people are going and having particular challenges? Um, are there a sort of a challenges of the moment that you have, you found yourself just repeating your recommendations for? Yeah, actually, um, a lot of this happened to be with like, um, as I mentioned, like complementary processes and complementary technologies. Um, one of the key things that stood out was like, just, you know, how do we make this work with click ops, right? Like, um, you know, there's, there's certain processes that might be there or certain processes that may not be there. But when you're talking about binding a technical and a non-technical process, like, how do you make that work? Because you're not going to be able to basically turn off all of the changes overnight. A couple of the customers that I was talking to is just like, we, we just explored the concept of, well, how do we build a united front on top? Right. Like, so how do we build something that kind of unites the two worlds together that gives us a way that we can include oversight and we can include understanding for the changes that we're going to make in production are most like our our, our most uh, pristine of, of environments that we want to keep uh, operating smoothly. So a couple of things I talked to talk to them about is like, well, who's, who's making these decisions? Right. Like, let's get them all together to start describing the difference between the click op decisions and the code decisions. Right. Um, and one thing that we talked about was a great uniter is on the description, right? So in code, you've got commits. So standardizing commits so that your operators can write things that are intelligible to non-technical people 
um, because ultimately that's what the outcome is. The outcome is non-technical, but the approach is technical. Um, gives you a way to kind of bind because you would do the same thing. I'm going to give you a series of steps. And again, the outcome is what's common. So how do we actually get those outcomes to be discussed in the same forum, right? Where we have the same governing body overseeing both sides of it. And then we can get more comfortable with the more technical process. Also, we can train our technical practitioners to be more adept at the process. The outcome at the end of the day is complete oversight for all of your technical changes so that anyone can understand what's going on with your production environment. So it leads to a really nice outcome. And again, that's what leads to um, enterprise maturity, which is more processes illuminating and being transparent over what's changing in the environment. If you look at any one of these things, like that's a common thing. So being able to implement some of these changes and find common areas. Um, I like to look like, like, do we have common areas at the lowest level and we keep abstracting up until we find that common layer? It's a really good practice to have so that you can figure out how these technologies or these processes can coexist um, in the longer term. Yeah, because when you look at automating something like identity management within an organization, you really need both sides. Neither side obsoletes the other, where you need the depth of knowledge from humans who might not be the most comfortable with automation to say, what is the correct outcome here? What was supposed to happen? And then you also need that technical expertise, that comfort with automation to say, let's here's how we can make the thing that was supposed to happen always happen. And breaking down those boundaries of communication or just those expectations of, oh, they wouldn't understand or people like that don't pay attention to people like me or whatever the problem may be is just, it's so much more than just a technological challenge. It is very much a human process challenge. There's a good practice in Agile of the retrospectives that I'm very much a, like, very much a proponent of. And um, being able to examine your processes too and ask what you could do better, right? Um, and in, 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 in an egoless fashion, right? Like to say, you know, we all believe that we're trying to do, but we have shared expertise, just as you mentioned, right? Where, how do we create a forum where we can get all of those experts in a room in a more efficient setting and actually, you know, troubleshoot how we could actually do better, right? In a way where we're not saying that we want to assess blame, but we want to, you know, take another leap forward because that opportunity to learn is that signal that you can take another leap forward, as opposed to, you know, ruminating on the past, you can actually better prepare for the future. Yeah, and just giving people what they want, like figuring out what they want. Do they want more reliability? Do they want less of copying and pasting the same thing over and over? Do they want better auditability for security and pointing out the way that a potential solution meets those needs? Just, it doesn't have to be adversarial like that. Yeah, and you know, it's like, and it's a, that's a very key point, right? We can approach this as a way to exert power, or we can approach it as a way to find commonalities and and improve, you know, improve the the experience for everyone, right? Um, and I think it's important to like, it, again, like when you approach that conversation, it's important that you set up those ground rules so that you're you're able to stay productive, and it uh, like holds all of us accountable when we're in those meetings. So that if, if, if we do start to bend toward our common natural reactions, we feel comfortable enough because the ground rules have been set that we're able to like say, hold on, we need to like figure out how we, we, we can do this a little better. And so again, like, I think these are some of the, I don't, not, to, not to go all preachy and agile <laughs> on anyone, but there's like, there's common things that I think that does well. You don't have to adopt the entire process, but like, again, being able to just pour over a situation and, you know, in a, in a nice, fair and balanced way, figure out like, how the team can improve is a really healthy thing. Oh yeah, and having someone to start those conversations, someone to pull everyone into the room together, get all the stakeholders on board and so forth is a huge catalyst for change and improvement in an organization. You might have some thoughts on if someone is just in a dev role, they're not in a leadership role at all, and they're pretty well fully subscribed with dev or ops tasks. Um, do you have thoughts on how someone can get leadership buy-in to start the ball rolling on getting this kind of cross-collaboration? A lot of it depends on the org structure that you have. Um, so hopefully, like, if you're in a place where you've got uh, supportive leadership, right, and everybody's, like, you know, very much engaged, you know, it's finding avenues to express your, your, um, to express your learnings, right? 
Uh, it might be lunch and learn, or it might be just with your team so you can get your manager involved and more exposed to what you're doing. Um, or it might be in a setting where you're doing an AMA or just like providing an anonymous question, right? Um, good and another good one are hackathons, right? Like if there's if there's free form inputs for your company to source new ideas, those are your opportunities to get buy-in, right? And especially like these are hot button issues. And I think the key thing for developers out there is to use terminology like operational efficiency and things like improving or reducing the time to deploy. All of these things are very key concepts to leaders because it helps reduce the bottom line, like the cost of actually getting a feature out. And the more you can attack that and make that more effective, like the more their ears are going to perk up. Because again, if you're trying to, you know, fiddle with the numbers on profit, right? You can either increase the revenue or you can reduce cost. You have more control over reducing costs than you do increasing revenue. And increasing revenue might be more expensive to do, right? It might increase your cost because you'll have to get, you know, all the necessary levers in motion to, to change that. So again, like just to recap, if you're a developer, work on how this is going to affect your operational efficiency. And you don't have to know money. You just have to know time and people. Right. If it reduces, a, if it cuts your time in half, that's human really, hours really are impactful. a cost. Yeah. Exactly. But you don't have to know the ins and outs of the numbers, but your leaders will know that. Right. So, you know, it's important to really talk about. And again, the, the key word to drop into any one of your decks or any like uh, wiki that you're putting together is operational efficiency. Like that is something that will really perk up or operate reducing operational cost. Those phrases are the things that will definitely get people listening. Yeah. And I think from a developer perspective, we can often take it for granted that like, well, obviously doing it that way is going to bump the hosting bill by some or obviously neglecting this measure, um, neglecting the safety measure is going to cause us a risk of this much downtime. But it's not always obvious for people who aren't as hands on with the engineering. So I think making that clear, making the connection between what you're doing and frankly, the company's success, often in the form of profit, is huge in communicating across cultures even that way. Yeah, and I think it's important to call out just what you said on the scale question of that too, right? So like, let's say you go and you say, well, I now with Terraform, we've reduced our deployment time from an hour to maybe 10 minutes, right? But you're saving a significant amount of time. You're going by an order of magnitude down. Now, a leader, a good leader is going to listen to that and say, like, well, actually, I know, like an engineering leader would say, well, I know we're making like 10 changes a day, probably, you know, 50 to 100 changes a week. If I'm actually like getting that savings on every single change, I can either push more or I can actually reduce risk, right? So all you want to do is plant that seed so they get thinking at the, the these different scales that they, they can do. And you've got them hooked at that point. You're going to get a message that says, hey, can you tell me a little bit more about this? Or you know, your team's going to be like, well, let's, like, let's do a POC or something like that. Suddenly, you're like on your road to implementation before you even know it. But again, it comes with like just looking at those particular numbers. And again, I've also respected developers' uh, boundaries. Like, I don't want you to get into the whole dollars and cents. Like, you know, that's getting you further away from what you love to do. And that's writing code and, and solving these major engineering problems. But being able to translate those, like we said, mm -hmm. to, you know, person hours and that, you know, involves a salary and everything. So all of that becomes really important to, to resonate with your leaders. And you're ultimately saying the same thing. You're saying, I improved it. You'd say, you're saying things will be better like this, but you're saying it simultaneously in a couple of superficially similar, but actually quite different languages. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me today, Jeff. Are there any final thoughts that you'd like to leave listeners with? Keep looking for ways to increase the efficiency. Like, I think that's one thing that um, if you're not building either like debt resolution or prospecting in the new processes for your team, like try to start that. Um, all of these things yield really big benefits uh, at the end of the day. So it's important to make sure that just as much as you're building new features, that you're helping your team out internally, looking at your build processes, all of these things can kind of help lead you to a better overall development experience. Um, and the other thing I'd say is like, it may not be in the areas where you expect, right? Like, I mean, even, even with uh, deployment with Terraform, right? Like, you might not think to look that way if you're using like maybe a platform as a service and you're doing a lot of scripting, but um, trying to find new ways for, for that to be more efficient and to be more maintainable over time is, is really good. So I definitely encourage that. I think you should fight for it. Um, 
what I've done as a developer in a previous life was to reserve a couple of hours of my time either to the end of the week where I could just do some freeform exploration. And that's what it would be. Can I improve the health of the team? Can I improve um, the overall process or can I improve the product in general? But it was my time so that I could build on my skill set. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you listeners for listening and we'll have additional resources for you in the show notes. 